everyone, my name is Natalie. Today I wanted to do a book review, which I haven't done since I think the Wainwright Prize uh, reading that I did during the summer. This book I have a lot to say about and I'm really curious to hear your thoughts as well. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I haven't written a written review of this yet, so th these uh, thoughts are probably going to be a little bit rambly. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to talk about this book and talk about some general things along with the themes in this book. So the book I wanted to review today is uh, The Fall of Language in the Age of English by Minae Mizumura. This is a Japanese non-fiction book. So this book is about language and it's about uh, specifically about Japanese language but it's also about language in general and especially to do with the uh, relationship between English and other languages. So this book is sort of a blend of a memoir of Mizumura's life uh, for, as being a writer, like traveling or doing uh, lectures because of her writing and uh, linguistics background. There is also a lot of Japanese history in this book because it is talking about language in a, the context of identity, of cultural identity and nationality and things like that. So the discussion on language is very embedded into other things um, that make a country its own uh, and the language as a sort of representation of that and part of the representation anyway. Um, so uh, parts of this book is about Japanese history and about Japanese language and the ways that it has transformed over time. Uh, and then a great deal of it is of a general sense talking about linguistics. Translation is definitely a major theme throughout this book. The thing that combines it all is words and the importance of words, uh, the importance of history in language and um, how language is uh, linked to identity. I will start off by saying that I didn't agree with everything in this book. Um, Mizumura has a quite negative uh, prospect for the um, the way that languages are changing uh, because of the internet but also because of English as being um, this growing thing uh, that is taking over the world in in ways that sort of strangles other languages. Basically what she says is that um, she talks about universal languages and local languages uh, and national languages as well. But the local language and the national language being the language, the language within a country spoken and written by people within a certain, a certain geographical location. Uh, she talks historically about uh, Latin as being this language that is universal. It is used as a way to share knowledge and that is also a thing she talks about in sort of the purpose of language and specifically the purpose of universal language as being something that is a very instrumental thing and um, how local languages and national languages more is more um, aesthetic and more linked to identity than it is um, has any instrumental value. In concern to the difference between native English speakers and uh, speakers of other languages, uh, and um, she, she says this, For those of us who know we are living in this asymmetry are the only ones condemned to perpetually reflect upon language, the only ones forced to know that the English language cannot dictate truths and that there are other truths in this world that cannot be perceived through the English language. So she talks about how the language that is used is changing the things that are said, the stories that are told. You're sort of reshaping into the framework of English and I think that is something that I've, I've often felt with English translations of, of uh, uh, for example, Japanese books. When books are translated from Japanese to English, they seem to uh, have this, they, the results seem to often be very, very simplistic in style. And I think that is a disservice to uh, the Japanese language because of the fact that um, Japanese language uses um, so much kanji, uh, the Chinese characters. She also talks about this actually in the book that the 
the language of Chinese and of uh, Japanese using these uh, kanji characters uh, are actually uh, image-based languages with other languages like most other languages in, in Europe. Uh, we have this use the sound uh, to create language. So the, the language is based on sound rather than the symbols, basically. In general, all, all translations have this problem where uh, in the original language something might have a certain amount of ambiguity, whereas that is often lost, I think, in translation. If she talks about translation as being this almost impossible thing, but also as being um, incredibly important for uh, other languages to thrive because the only way to, uh, to really a local language and make it a national language is for it to be translated, for it to represent the country rather than being uh, only a spoken thing, uh, only a local thing. Uh, so the act of translation is, is vital to make uh, a language that is local, a national language, and, and part of the, the global conversation. I think there's a lot of things to, to keep in mind in what you're expecting out of a translation. Um, I did actually do um, a discussion video way back when I started this channel um, about translation and what I was expecting in terms of quality from a translation. Um, and I said something along the lines of I, I didn't want to feel like I was reading an original English text. I wanted to feel that I was reading a different language. Uh, somehow I wanted that to, to translate into the English translation. If you're sort of reshaping it into the English equivalent, you're not actually experiencing the original work very much. Translating is often this balance work, I think, between um, readability of the, of the translation and keeping the original intent, um, meaning and, and style and feel and all that. Right after she talks about the, the truths thing, uh, she also says, they are not condemned to know, for instance, that the works that are usually translated into English are those that are both thematically and linguistically the easiest to translate, that often only reinforce the worldview constructed by the English language, and preferably that entertain readers with just the right kind of exoticism. I really appreciate the way that she um, discusses how language and translation shape our understanding of the world and our view of the world. We perceive certain stories in the way we do because of these barriers that aren't necessarily obvious, that there's a bias within what kind of books that are being translated, which kind of stories are being um, given attention from a certain country. Um, it might be more obvious if you're reading a lot of those, uh, a lot of translated works uh, in general, or a lot of translated works from a specific uh, country. The choices behind language and of translation and of uh, the writing, uh, writing and publishing, uh, shapes the worldview we get, uh, and that it's not always um, obvious what the um, mechanics behind uh, is doing. I hope I have convinced you that this book is definitely worth reading, especially if you're interested in language or the connection of language and identity and cultural identity, nationality, uh, what it means for a, a country's history to have their own language that is read uh, uh, or the, with works that are read and translated and read in other countries and other parts of the world. Uh, if you have read this book, I would love to hear your thoughts about it. Uh, I, I, th I think this is going to be a book that I think about for a long time and that I will probably end up revisiting uh, many times because there's so much embedded into this uh, book that I can't possibly have gotten everything out of it that I can um, on this first reading. So definitely recommend this book. I hope you enjoyed this rambly uh, review and I will talk to you soon. Bye!